You are watching The Context. It's time for our new weekly segment, AI Decoded. Welcome to AI Decoded, that time of the week when we look in depth on the more eye-catching stories in the world of artificial intelligence. We're going to start with the Guardian newspaper. It says, according to Israeli intelligence sources, Israel's military has been using an AI tool known as Lavender to identify Hamas targets across Gaza. Israel has rejected this and has released a statement which reads, the IDF does not use an artificial intelligence system that identifies terrorist operatives. Next, we have an opinion piece in The New Statesman, why men shouldn't control artificial intelligence. It asks whether uh, existential anxiety about AI is just the patriarchy's fear of itself. In a few minutes, uh, we see a robot uh, called Sophia respond to a question about how AI can come up with a roadmap to a more equitable society. The FT reports the US and the UK have signed a landmark agreement on artificial intelligence, uh, becoming the first countries to formally cooperate on how to test and assess risks from emerging AI models. In the Wall Street Journal, is the internet big enough to satisfy the huge appetite for data the world's leading AI companies need to grow? The Times reports more than 200 musicians asking technology companies to stop using their songs to train artificial intelligence models. Artists like Billie Eilish and R.E.M. are warning the uh, music ecosystem is at risk of destruction. And finally, are you ready for your fast food to be cooked by robots? A U.S. convenience chain says it's installed an AI-powered robotic system to give customers, quote, fully customizable fried chicken, french fries and other items. Uh, we'll show you that later. With me is Stephanie Hare, technology author and AI commentator. Stephanie, great to have you as always. Uh, should we start with a very sobering story on the front of the Guardian newspaper? Yes, so we are looking at a new frontier in the fields of warfare, which is, and it must be said that the Israeli Defense Force has denied this story, but in the story, which claims to cite six Israeli intelligence officers who've all used a system called Lavender to identify human targets. And that's not particularly new. The IDF has been using AI to identify buildings and structures as targets. That was the system called the Gospel. This new system, though, is called Lavender. And the difference is, rather than picking a, build a building to attack or blow up, they're going after humans. So the question becomes, who's responsible and who's making these decisions? And is there a proper human oversight? The article would suggest not. These six intelligence officers in the story claim that they were spending about 20 seconds maximum to approve the targets that the AI was deciding for assassination. That's time. Time scales uh, will raise some eyebrows, certainly. Just want to bring you the response quoted in the Guardian newspaper from uh, the Israeli army. The IDF does not use an artificial intelligence system that identifies terrorist operatives or tries to predict whether a person is a terrorist, adding information systems are merely tools for analysts in the target identification process. Right. Let's move on to the front of the new statesman. This is one of those headlines, isn't it? Why men shouldn't control artificial intelligence is strong enough. But then the subheadline there, existential anxiety about AI is just the patriarchy's fear of itself. Stephanie, <laughs> talk us through this. I mean, as a feminist, this was a particularly enjoyable article to read. But then <laughs> with my British sense of fair play, I had to go, hmm. Are we really saying that AI would be better designed if it was only being designed by women, for instance, or only people who are left-handed, or only Americans versus Peruvians? So we have to really ask, what is this article arguing for? So it says, you know, projection is a mental process by which people attribute to others what they would actually do themselves. So when you have a bunch of male billionaires, the article argues, not me, I should say, <laughs> worrying about existential risk and domination, the author makes the analogy that that's really because that's what an Elon Musk would do, or that's what a Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg would do. But it's not necessarily what all of us would do, and hopefully not what a diverse, inclusive team would do. So it's really a call for diversity. Interesting. And so that's real psychology, isn't it? Yeah. It's basically going inside the brains of these people who are in charge and thinking what they're most scared of is a projection of 
their biggest weaknesses and so therefore it's power and, and domination. And so you've made the caveats that this is not you. Where, where do you stand on that as a, as a theory, though? Is oh, it something I, that, I mean, uh, presumably I, you're going to support diversity in, in, of the people making these big decisions? But. Yes, but not in a sort of politically correct, woke way that some people might get very nervous about. I'm actually looking at it in the perspective that we have here in this country with GCHQ, which is neurodiverse teams, more diverse teams, perform better than monocultural teams because they see the world differently. And in the, the domain of cybersecurity, which is what GCHQ is all about, keeping the country safe, you need different perspectives to identify risk. Okay. So it's a danger to just have groupthink. I see. OK, well, we know what the article thinks. We now know what you think. <laughs> Should we see what AI thinks? Now, Bloomberg did a series where they asked a, an AI robot, Sophia, um, a, a series of questions. One of them was how to make an AI system more equitable, potentially. Let's take a listen. Come up with a roadmap, not just with a goal, but with a roadmap for a more equitable uh, society. AI definitely has the potential to contribute to a more equitable society, but it requires a collective effort and the inclusion of diverse perspectives. We need to set ambitious goals for AI that prioritize issues like housing, global fairness, and climate impact. A roadmap can guide us towards achieving these goals and ensuring that AI serves the greater good. Stephanie, I don't want to say you could be replaced, but that answer sounded a lot like the, oh, your answer. I don't no. know what that means. I don't know who came up with it first. It might be a trained <laughs> off of my book. <laughs> could, well, good point. Good point. Right, <laughs> let's move to something potentially really important. We've been following legislation, attempts at regulation, of course, uh, over the weeks and months. US and UK signed landmark agreement on testing safety of mm. AI. This is in the uh, FT. What's this about? I love this story because it's all about how the US and the UK always want to be the first at having a safety summit. And now they're the first to agree that they're going to test AI. But then when you actually go into the article, the United States AI Safety Summit has actually done no work on this since the summit that we had back in November. Right. So they're signing lots of stuff, but nobody's doing anything. When you actually look into it, they don't have the budget or the staff yet. I'm sure the United States has other things going on. So we can feel that this is hopeful, but are we reassured? I would say the jury is still out on this, but it's still exciting to see countries committing to it and other governments will watch. And the idea is, I was at Bletchley Park for the, the, for the UK and the signing and the announcements and the great and the good were there. And the idea is that rather than let private companies develop all this AI on their own, actually mm. they'll hand it over and so that the governments or government people uh, who they're appointing can have a look inside and check it's actually safe. Is that right? Yes. And the idea is that the US needs to be involved. It can't just be the UK because most big AI companies or companies using AI are American. But we have to acknowledge China is not anywhere involved in this agreement, nor was it really involved with the summit very much. And that is an AI superpower. So again, no resting on laurels when it comes to AI safety. And as a principle, do you think this model is going to be enough? Because, like you say at the moment, you're sceptical of resources and, and uh, time spent on it so far. But let's presume that that does all come, the agreements continue and they work together. Is it enough to warn again and warn off the potential worst downsides of AI? I would argue no. We've got the EU AI Act coming on quite soon. The finalising of that's happening this spring in a couple of years implementation. That's a start. But, you know, there's no rush to regulate here in the UK. There's no rush to regulate in the United States. So how are people going to be able to sue? How are they going to be getting responsibility and liability for when AI goes wrong? And that's just in, in the countries I've just listed. AI is a global phenomenon. It's like public health or climate change. It's going to have to involve every country on Earth. I think we're just at the beginning of building our AI safe, safety infrastructure. Interesting. And just very lastly and quickly on this, because you mentioned things like China. Now, China were invited, I remember, to Bletchley mm. Park to day one of the summit, but yeah. not to day two when they really talked about more sensitive things. Yes. How do you see... China and, and other countries working with China? Well, right now it's very awkward because China keeps stealing people's data and launching cybersecurity attacks and then getting caught for it. So it's hard to work with them and have trust. At the same time, they can't be left out of the discussion. We're constantly working to find common ground with them and we must respect the work that they're doing. Some of it's very impressive. Interesting. Right, let's move on to Wall Street Journal, because this is interesting. For data guzzling AI companies, the internet 
is too small. Mm. What, what does that mean, the internet is too small? I love that. It's like, you know, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. This is, you think the internet has loads of data and you think that the world existence, not just human, but all of it, is something that could be datafied and it could, but it hasn't yet. And that's what this article makes so beautiful. Most of the data available online is useless for AI training because it contains flaws. It's not structured properly. Um, this researcher who's quoted thinks that it's about a tenth of the information gathered is useful. Most of what's wow. on the internet is garbage. Who knew? <laughs> wow. And so is there any kind of solution? What, yeah. what? Of course. Um, there's going to be a whole field. Some of the most cutting edge research is going to be looking to structure data, to create synthetic data, which is where it's actually generated from within a company rather than going out and getting it and extracting it. Right. We are, again, on the cusp of this. So I love that we've identified the problem. It, the problem answers with a solution. We will have a new field being created. Interesting. Well, that feeds into this next story, which is something, again, we are going to continue to return to musicians from Billie Eilish to REM Unite to demand protection from AI. So this is AI going out and crawling the Internet. And these artists, these musicians, want it to stop. Well, I mean, quite. And it's not just musicians, it's actors, it's, it's writers whose books might be being copied and turned into Bloomberg videos. You just don't know, do you? Because there's no real regulation. There's no playing field on this. So right now you've got the New York Times suing Microsoft and OpenAI saying you can't train on the New York Times. So until we get a couple of lawsuits that finally make a decision, that's one way of solving it. Or we can have what the musicians are asking for, which is kind of like a good behavior pledge. That always works very well, yeah. um, right? Or we could get some actual laws passed. So, again, let's see how it plays out. And specifically on the music, then, you've got AI going out and listening to Billie Eilish or whatever and, and using that to do what? To try and come up with its, with its own songs? So many things. So you could be impersonating a right. singer. So, like, take... Take a great song like Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin and give me the version as sung by Dolly Parton, which I would love to hear, by the way. <laughs> so you could do that. But does Ms. Parton get paid for that? Does Led Zeppelin get paid for that? Did they have consent in that, etc.? Somebody could put that on the Internet and I'm sure will right now after putting it out, right? Like it gets just that quickly right. uh, that you can do this. So that's one thing. But it could also be training off of their lyrics and even off of their musical composition and arrangement, which is that's their proprietary product. And, and so is the, is the potential end game, I don't know whether it is anyone's end game, that, but that it could learn, AI would learn all the different styles of all the different artists out there and then basically just keep on generating its own music and we would go on to whatever our music playlists are and yeah. just listen to AI generated stuff and we don't need any Well, I think it could get quite derivative. It's sometimes like when your favourite band maybe goes on too long and needs to okay. stop touring. It okay. could just, sometimes they have a golden period and you wish they'd stopped. <laughs> No names. Well, I'm, not, I'm not commenting on any of that. <laughs> right, we've got one, one last uh, article to look at. This is The Verge. Now there's an AI gas station with robot fry cooks. Uh, we'll take a look at it in action whilst you explain what's going on. So. Okay, okay, sorry. So this robot is going to be making your chicken wings for you. And to be honest, it can make any food and fries. Um, obviously, there's not going to be any fun banter with this chef, but efficient and, in theory, controlled product every time. So you would be able to get the same thing if you gave it specification. I want it Cajun, I want it jerk chicken, I want it you know, tender, um, dark meat only, etc. So why is that interesting? Fully customizable fried chicken and French fries. I mean... Don't get me wrong, I love both of these things dearly. A, the, the realm of variety isn't as big as you'd think, and B, do you need a robot for that? Is that a problem that needs solving? Is that a problem that needs solving? That's a good question to end on. I'm afraid we are out of time. <laughs> Stefan, thank you so much. We are out of time. We'll do the same again next.